Good evening. Maybe two more people. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I have your attention? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we're still, uh, our two other panellists are just uh, <laughs> wafting over. We suddenly <laughs> lost them, but they yeah. will uh, <laughs> appear in uh, any minute now. Uh, I, I'll just uh, start proceedings. I'm Gwen Robinson, the editor-at-large of the Nikkei Asian Review and uh, the president of the Foreign Correspondents Club. And uh, I'd just like to thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, very, um, uh, it's a very uh, historic day with the results of uh, the March 24th elections. But before we launch into the panel and I introduce uh, our panelists, I'd just like to make a couple of announcements. Um, you know, you've all shown your interest in uh, uh, the political situation in Thailand. And uh, just to add to our running uh, series of programs, next week we have uh, Tanatorn, uh, the head of the Future Forward Party, coming to uh, the press club to talk about the situation facing Future Forward. That'll be on the 15th. Uh, the details will be out on our website uh, very soon. I advise you to sign up for that if you're interested because I think that one will be popular. Um, and secondly, tomorrow night uh, at the club here, we're going to have a special event to commemorate a <coughs> dear and departed uh, colleague, Arno Dubus, uh, who died uh, just recently. And uh, if any of you know him or would like to pay respects, uh, there'll be a wake. Uh, could we have some uh, calm order up there at the back? Um, there'll be a wake uh, tomorrow night from 6 p.m. The French ambassador will speak and uh, anybody who knew him. So all are welcome. Uh, please come if you would like to pay your respects. And uh, now we'll just turn to uh, the program of the evening, Thailand's protect, protracted election, what comes next? Um, as you all know, we've just had the final results of the March 24 general election, the first since the 2014 military coup that installed uh, General Prayut chan as Prime Minister, and the first held under the 2017 constitution drafted under the ruling military government. Um, None of the 77 parties that competed won an outright majority in the 500-seat lower house. Um, the Election Commission has confirmed that the opposition Pua Thai Party won the most seats in the lower house, 136, compared to the pro-military Palang Pracharat Party. Um, but Thailand's 250-seat upper house, as we know, is chosen by the military government um, and uh, is likely to back that uh, party, the pro-military party. It's expected that the lower and upper houses will vote together for the next prime minister. It's speculated within a few weeks. We're not 100% sure, just like we're not sure of a lot of things that go on these days. Um, current prime minister, Prayut, is the PPRP's candidate and it's not uh, out of the question that he is likely to remain in his job. Um, the Election Commission came out to finally announce the party list seats for all parties uh, yesterday with the average calculation of 71,000 votes per single party list seat, except some smaller parties that managed to gain seats even with just half the number <coughs> of votes. And our um, expert panel is going to explain how and why they did that. Um, but what I think has become clearer than ever in the last 24 hours is that the formula for calculating party list seats and the processes of this election have been very unclear or at least confusing to a lot of people and strangely enough um, appears to have produced a result that favours the uh, junta's interests. Uh, the Commission's endorsement of 149 party list MPs on Wednesday has effectively reduced the number of seats gained by the opposition bloc, the loose coalition of opposition parties to 245. And while the established opposition parties, the Democrats and, sorry? Thank you. While the established opposition parties, the Democrats and Pua Thai suffered setbacks, the new Future Forward Party, led by the aforenamed Tanatorn, was a big winner. But Tanatorn and a key lieutenant, as we know, faced potential disqualification, uh, fighting a big battle on that front. 
and uh, even so the pro-military side, even with their very big built-in advantages, are clearly going to struggle to form a coalition from 20 other parties in the lower house. So um, there's many questions to uh, address tonight, including what the outlook will be for the new parliament. Uh, it looks, uh, the prospects look messy. Uh, how powerful will be the 250 seat Senate? And uh, then, you know, looking at the political situation, what becomes of the defeated Democrats? who are now contemplating their own leadership contest after the resignation of leader Abbasid, and what of the once mighty Puatai, which suffered uh, some very unexpected setbacks, including the loss of its satellite party ahead of the vote, and who will be the new Prime Minister? How will the new Thai Parliament, to be made up of appointed and electric rep elected representatives, function in this fragmented and uncertain political environment? So, to answer your questions, uh, I'd like to introduce this excellent panel. To my far right is Dr. Jade Donovanik, President of the Faculty of Law, College of Asian Scholars, <laughs> and former advisor to the Constitution Drafting Commission, uh, who has some excellent insights into how we ended up with this system. Uh, next to, <laughs> sorry about that, Dr. Jay. Just thought I'd, I'd tee Good people up there. for their questions. Um, next to him is Dr. Paul Chambers, a lecturer, special advisor on international affairs at <laughs> Narasuan University, <laughs> author of some widely admired books, uh, including the role on the role of the military in Thai politics. Next to him is Dr. Anasan Uno, Dean of Tamasat University's <laughs> Faculty of Sociology <laughs> and Anthropology. <laughs> and finally, uh, Jonathan Head, the BBC's Bangkok-based Southeast Asia correspondent <laughs> and former uh, president of the Foreign Correspondents Club and current vice president. So I think we will start with you, Dr. Jade. Over to you. <coughs> and we'll have questions afterwards, so save up the curly ones. Okay, thank you, Gwen. Good evening, distinguished guests. I will not explain what Gwen was pointing at first, how we become, uh, or how we landed with this system, which is called short MMA or mixed member apportionment. We can leave that to the, uh, the question part if you wanna know about it. But because today we are going to talk about what's next, okay. Talking about the system, of course, as yesterday, the Constitutional Court said that the organic law, section 128 of the organic law on the calculation of the mixed member apportionment system is in line or is not uh, in discrepancies with the Constitution. Okay? So it's constitutional with Article 91 of the Constitution. However, the Constitutional Court did not say how the calculation of the system is to be made. So that remains unclear. Many experts which did not draft the law said that there are many formulas. They came up with so many formulas. There has been explanation from the constitutional drafter as well as the law drafter that there is one calculation. And that was the calculation that turned out to be the law, whether or not you take that. If we put this calculation together with all the formulas that all the experts propose. We have so many ways, so many means, so many mechanisms to give MPs to that and this party. So that will be the next step from now, that people are contesting, people are objecting, and you see, Pua Thai came up front as the spearhead. To me, Pua Thai has no say in this calculation because Pua Thai is under a situation that we call an 
overhang mandate situation that p e r Thai should have been stopped at about 111 or 112 numbers of the MP, but the system respect the voters. If the voters in the constituencies give their vote to any one of the parties, and if it turns out that the number of the MPs are more than what they were supposed to gain, that's fine, because it was the direct vote. Therefore, p e r t h a i can keep 136, 137 MPs. Fine. But p e r t h a i has nothing to do with the party list. It's only the rest of the other parties. If Future Forward Anakot Mai is to object the calculation, to me it's fine, but not p e r t h a i p e r t h a i has nothing to do with it. Okay. Secondly, there might be some other parties, not only the Future Forward, not only p e r t h a i that will be contesting, objecting the system. And that should remain for quite some time, and that probably goes to some courts, constitutional court, whichever court that the law opens for. Thirdly, the Senate, all these senators are coming. Perhaps tonight we will know who they are. <laughs> By knowing who they are, the speculation of many is that. 250 senators will be voting for Palang p a c h a r a t or voting for General Prayut to become the next prime minister. But who knows? You have to see the 250 names because if the NCPO or whoever is involved in the selection of these people is a little bit strategic. Or quite strategic or highly strategic, they will not make 250 senators to go one way, unless they're not, which I might be wrong, that they are, at least a bit. So the 250 senators, you might have about 50, up to 100, of whom you cannot say is on which side. But another about 150, all the way up to 200, perhaps you can totally say that they are on the Palang p a c h a r a t NCPO or General Prayut side. But in the round of vote, when they have to vote for the prime minister, will they vote 250? Will they vote 150? Will they vote 200? They might not have to. Why would they have to? Because in the vote. The counting number is only 376, which is more than half of the two houses together. The vote will be a bicameral vote. Why do you have to go like 400, 500? You just go five, 400 a little bit. You don't have to go like near 500 if you want to be strategic. So this might happen, and on the other hand, they might want to show that they get the highest number. So my sec my speculation might be wrong. The next thing from the vote of prime minister is that, because the constitution did not say when can a no confidence vote be proposed, so perhaps the opposition, whoever will be the opposition, together with p u r t h a i Future Forward, might take a chance to just call for a no confidence vote. And they vote no confidence. Maybe they will have some sort of discussion. They have something to say, and which is easy. They can say, "We don't trust you, because you are the coup government or the former coup government. You are military. You cheat the election. Whatever. We don't trust you. So we wanted to just raise our hand. If it turns out that the Government at that time is a minority government. They don't get the majority of the house. They're in trouble. But will they? Will the trouble remain long? Well, perhaps not. 
the older constitution, the constitution of 2007, the t constitution of 1997, the no confidence vote will have to be coupled with the nomination of the next prime minister. But not this constitution of 2017. There has no particular clause that there must be a nomination of the next president, uh, sorry, the next uh, prime minister. So when there is no such nomination, can you nominate General Prayut again? Because the Constitution said within the first five years, you will have to get the Senate on board to vote for the Prime Minister. So yes, the lower house, if the opposition has a higher number, has the majority of the house, fine. You can vote no confidence on the Prime Minister. But he then can again come back with the vote of the Senate. Okay. If this goes on and on and on, then the problem will strike the House of Representatives when the budget bill comes. Because the budget bill will have to be voted only in the lower house. And normally in a parliamentary system, if the budget bill does not pass the parliament, then the government should resign, okay, which normally that happens, unless they take a risk and sort of a, a limit, small chance to dissolve the parliament, which will be unconventional somehow. But not under this constitution, not under this Thai constitution, because they might not resign. They might choose some other ways, some other mechanism, which, which I don't know yet. If you find a way or if you can guess, please tell me. In the end, they might not wish to stay that long. Because within the first five years, the Senate will be very important. The Senate stay for five years. So even with dissolution of the parliament, even with nullification of the election result, and we go on for the next election, whoever comes back, the 250 senators will still be able to vote for that next prime minister, and whoever will become the next prime minister, maybe not General Prayut, However, I think you can guess from which part that prime minister will come from. So I think this is what next for Thailand. This sort of whatever you want to call it, a, a bad cycle or a vicious cycle, or a remaining problem to be solved, or whatever words you want. I think that's what next from today. So I'll just take that time. Thank you Thank very you. much, Dr. Jane. That's a good start. Uh, next to Paul, if you want to tackle those remaining problems to be solved. Or <laughs> give us your, uh... Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Gwen, and thank you, everyone at FCCT, for having me. Um, today is an historic day. You know, May 9th, we have 95% of the lower house uh, selected by the uh, Election Commission of Thailand. Tomorrow, most likely, we're going to have the senators uh, available, the names of the senators available as they were uh, eventually selected by the junta, military junta, uh, as led by Prawit Wong uh, in, in the selection committee. So, um, you know, with this 95% selected or you know by the ECT uh, or the results that we see I just want to look at what were the benefits and the drawbacks of this election okay and of course there are benefits uh, apparent benefits that I see first we can say that the military dictatorship of Prayut Chanocha and Prawit is at an end because we're going to have a return to democracy, okay? Uh, and as such, the shadow of junta decree power can now give way to more political space. Um, Thailand seems to have reverted back to constitutional democracy. So these are all good things, okay? But this comes with drawbacks, okay? First, the election, we have to admit, was held under a junta. Not that many elections can be free and fair 
and held under a junta because a junta doesn't usually allow for too much accountability relative to elected governments. Uh, that being said, also we can say that before 2014, the system in Thailand was, was more democratic. This is a less democratic system. And I'll give you an example. Looking at the Senate, the 1997 Constitution allowed for an elected Senate. The 2007 Constitution allowed for a, a half, it's kind of a half elected Senate. But now, <laughs> it's an appointed Senate. So we're going down. <laughs> so a lot of this is a drawback. Another thing I want to say, too, is, um, you know, there was a, a coup in 2014. And so this junta it, and it's uh, uh, those who it appointed uh, are the ones who drew up the, uh, the rules of the game, including this very convoluted electoral formula that's subject to manipulation. Um, there are other rules of the game. And as a result, you could argue, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that this was a dirty election, but I would like to say that this, you could argue that this was perhaps uh, one of the most manipulated elections. Manipulated before the election because a junta that overthrew democracy created new rules and made, created this convoluted system and also allowed for elected, uh, appointed senators. And then after the election, <laughs> there were so many times when the election commission uh, was, it seemed at least, to be following many of the orders of the junta. We have to remember these election commissioners were endorsed by the junta. So I think it's fair to argue that this election was one of the most manipulated before the election and after the election in Thai history. Okay. I also want to say that even though I'm down on the election, obviously. <laughs> Even though I want to say that, let's take a look at how the parties fared, because that was one of the questions that Gwen wanted me to address. <laughs> First, I think, despite it all, Pua Thai remains electorally strong. Um, you know, though, because of the new junta favored electoral <laughs> formula, it did receive less uh, seats than it would have. Um, Jade pointed out the, to me earlier about the strategy, or maybe I heard you talking of different <laughs> satellite parties that uh, uh, Pua Thai tried to use. Well, that didn't seem to work out very, as well as it could have, partly because Thai Rock's a chat party was disqualified. But Pua Thai is still alive and well. We have to admit that. Second, Palang Pracharat. It's a junta proxy party, appears to be a powerful new parliamentary force through which conservatives can express themselves. Okay, I know this one conservative, he loves Palang Pacharat. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Third, the Democrats are, de are, are temporarily history, sorry. <laughs> okay, they're a torn asunder by the greater popularity of uh, either Future Forward or Palang Pracharat. Okay, they're totally factionalized. Now that could change again. And finally, the new creature on the block is Future Forward Party. Uh, powerful force in parliament. I, I think it frightens the military and the aristocracy. Why? Because Future Forward is not toxin, okay? It's not the bad boy toxin that can easily be uh, demonized and vilified. No, it's a you know, really vivacious, new party with a young leader, and a nice new message of reform. Okay, so I think that the dissolution, the possible future dissolution of future forward party, if it ever did happen, would be chaotic for Thailand. So now that the, uh, let's move away from the parties, now that the election results have been formalized, it's 95%, the question, who will become prime minister? So everyone's thinking about this now, right? Who is it gonna be? What are the scenarios? I love talking about this. 
So I, I kind of got it down to three for talking to several people today. And it kept changing because the events were changing. So at first, second, third, first. So for <laughs> one of the, okay, I think probably the first possible scenario most likely is, yeah, Palam Pracharat would serve as the dominant party in a ruling coalition, but it would be a weak coalition. Okay, so many parties. Uh, and you have to like give different portfolios to different faction leaders or party leaders. So many, it's an unwieldy coalition. How long can that last, right? Uh, the second possibility, scenario, there could be a stalemate, really. Because it's possible that the Democrats are not happy with their slice of cake in terms of cabinet positions. And so they're not happy to work with Palang Pracharat, but then the Senate is always going to be on the Palang Pracharat side, or likely to be. And so you could have a stalemate, okay? Which then means that if the two sides are unable, the pro-junta or anti-junta parties are unable to come to any uh, decision on the government, there could be a caretaker government, okay? An appointed caretaker government, you know, ultimately all these decisions have to be endorsed upstairs by the, the finalizer, that's what I'll say. <laughs> the finalizer, and if the finalizer is not happy, then I think a caretaker, and there'll be elections next year, okay? The third possibility is, well, you know, Anu Tin. <laughs> We know that Anno Tin is always mentioned as a possibility, so I'll put him third. Right now, he's in the, probably going to be in uh, the Palang Pacharat coalition. And if Prayut is out of the picture, Anno Tin. Okay. Uh, so I, I would say these are the three possibilities. How will the new Thai parliament uh, function in a fragmented and uncertain political environment? And that's going to be kind of tough. <laughs> okay. So I, I expect there to be political pandemonium in parliament. <laughs> and so if the Palang Pracharat party wants to pass bills, budget bills, it's gonna be tough, very difficult. And you know, the new laws in, under the constitution don't uh, create a system of party discipline. So a member of, uh, I don't know, Palang Pracharat could vote with the other side, it'd be very easy. It's a very unwieldy, chaotic pandemonium, which means that the, whatever government is in power, except an appointed government, will not last long, okay? Now, let's just add to the system, the situation, a situation where it's possible in the future that uh, Tanaton, who's gonna be speaking here, I think very soon, he could be found guilty by the courts. And then he's out of the political picture. What's going to happen? Ah, uh, well, I think there could even be rioting in the streets. Uh, there could be. Uh, or make it worse, if the Anakot Mai, Future Forward Party, was somehow dissolved, yeah, there could be rioting in the streets. Uh, and we could then eventually come back to that quote from General Apirat Kong Songpong, Army Commander, who said, if there's rioting last November, he said, if there's rioting, in the, and I might have to repress that rioting. There might even be a coup, he said. So we come to our fourth possibility. There could be a new junta. So um, I just want to say that the strongest person in Thailand today, aside from the king, of course, is, is the army commander, of course, Apirat Kong Songpong. Okay. The junta leadership is on the ropes, folks. <laughs> it's on the ropes. But Apirat is extremely strong. He retires in 2020. Uh, he's likely to continue exercising enormous clout for quite a while. Meanwhile, very close to Apirat is First Army Chief General Narong Pan. Uh, he's also, he and Apirat are part of this Wong Taiwan faction. It's not the faction of the, the junta leadership, uh, also considered close to uh, the finalizer. Uh, <laughs> now, in October of 2019, he'll be promoted. There's a, basically, what, I, what I'm trying to say is, 
The Wong Tae Wan faction, which is not the faction of the junta leadership, is the new army group that has power. And this, promo this promotion line of Wong Tae Wan is going to last for a long time. I would thus say that as soon as the junta people are out and the Queen's Guard faction, which they represent, is out, I think we're going to see the army stabilizing under Wong Tae Wan and under the finalizer. Okay. So um, in conclusion, I just want to say that after, after five years of military dictatorship in Thailand, uh, the junta leadership appears to be on the ropes. And in the post, especially in this post-election environment, uh, power, you know, the, uh, the new military leadership is strong. Okay, that's not the junta. Um, but democratic forces are desperate for political change. And so I am expecting that, you know, this is like election part one this year. But I expect to be another election coming soon, maybe next year, and there'll be much more chances at pluralist competition. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, Paul. That was, uh, <laughs> theatrical and entertaining and also uh, took us from one extreme to another. I thought you were opening with the all rosy uh, scenario and we've um, <laughs> been through pandemonium and, and rioting in the streets and come back uh, in the middle. So maybe I'll leave it to Dr. Anasorn to um, uh, give thank his you, uh, Gwen. view. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, the significance of the election. Um, many of which you know, reflect in the election results and many of which are unintended, which needs the post-election coping strategy, which in the near future will bring uncertainty and chaos in Thai politics. First of all, you know, uh, for this election, I think this is the continuation or the continuity of the more than decade-long conflict, roughly speaking, between the old political elites and the emerging forces, you know, brought about by changes in economics and politics, you know, in particular in the rural area. And for the old political elites, you know, I think they are represented by, as we know, the Palang Pacharat Party, you know, and its supporters, you know, uh, you know, those, you know, uh, urban, educated urban middle class people, or, you know, the PDRC, and also the, those in the south, you know, uh, brought about by the Democrat Party. The, um, and, but also we have the emerging forces, you know, which, you know, their uh, political parties are the Thai party and also you know, other, you know, alliance parties. And for this, you know, uh, emerging forces, they have been waiting for, you know, almost five years, you know, after being suppressed by the military junta, you know, because you have the, you know, special laws, you know, right, Article 44 and also other, you know, uh, laws that, you know, uh, don't allow you to do the political gathering. And these people, they've been waiting for, you know, the election, you know, uh, for their voice to be heard and for their, you know, uh, uh, inspiration to be accounted. And, but anyway, in addition to the two, you know, political forces, I mean, the old political part, uh, elites and also the emerging forces, we also have ordinary people. We have, you know, uh, like uh, urban, you know, Poor people, people who you know uh, live, you know, can't meet at their end life, you know. And we also have like uh, those who wanted to get away from the prolonged political conflicts. Actually, they have no, you know, they have nothing to do with the political conflict. But you know, as you know, part of the society, they need to bear the consequences of the conflict. And we, you know, we have a lot of these, you know, kind of people. You know, they try to like. Uh, find the, perhaps the third way or the third party, you know, rather than, you know, the Palang uh, the or the Pertai Party, we also have these people. And anyway, we also have the new voters. We have at least, you know, as you know, right, we have six million people uh, aged from 18 to 25. We have never 
what before, you know, after you, the military coup, uh, the, uh, the last election. And this, you know, consumed you know, a huge amount of the new waters. And, you know, this, you know, uh, like uh, struggles, you know, among, you know, uh, different uh, factions in societies, you know, reflect in the uh, election results. Uh, first, and it brings about, I think, at least four changes in uh, political landscapes. The first one we have, you know, the advent of, you know, the uh, old political elites in disguise, you know, in the, you know, as the, the Palang Bacharat party. And uh, they, uh, because I say this because, you know, uh, for the constituencies that they won, uh, we saw the changes in uh, Bangkok, as you know, right? Uh, about uh, 12 seats in Bangkok, you know, won by the, uh, Palang uh, Bacharat, which you know, formerly you know, being you know, uh, uh, part of the uh, Democrat Party. So it's like uh, those who supported the coup, they, you know, when it comes to the election. It's really interesting because uh, I know a lot of people in person. Uh, when Prayut was in power, oh, he's still in power, uh, but anyway, prior to the election, they were not satisfied with the performance of the or the NCPO government, you know, either in terms of, you know, uh, economy or in terms of your know, development or anything else. But when it comes to the election, they have no choice. They need to have a tough guy to prevent the return of the taxing proxy uh, in their opinion, right? So they chose to elect, you know, uh, uh, the Palang Pacharat Party. That's why the Palang Pacharat Party won 12 seats in Bangkok. You know, formerly, you know, uh, won by the Democrat Party. That's the first thing. That's the first change. And the second one is the loss of the Democrat Party, primarily because you know uh, people thought that they were too weak yeah. to be there. You know, like uh, representatives. You know, in fighting with taxing, too weak. In particular, when you know you saw like uh, Abhisit Vajachiva, he is not that tough. So when compared to Prayut, and the second thing is that uh, there is like uh, you know um, uh, the fragmentation in the leadership in the Democrat Party itself. You know because uh, uh, Abhisit himself has not gained popularity among the you know uh, Democrat Party's member, in particular in the south. Because you know, right? In the south, you know, you need to like, uh, you be the southerners, you know, to be, you know, accepted by the, you know, MPs in the south. Whereas, you know, Pisit uh, Vajshiva, he is not the southerner. And prior to that, you know, he gained popularity or acceptance in the uh, Democrat Party because he has a close connection with Chua Lee Pai. You know, so, you know, sometimes he call, he was called like a Chuan Lee Pai's, you know, uh, son or something like that. But anyway, after Chuan, you know, lost his like uh, popularity among, uh, you know, the the the, uh, uh, the Democrat Party's members in the South. So uh, he obviously also lost his, uh, you know, acceptance or popularity among uh, the uh, Democrat Party members in the South as well. And the third change, I think, we have the emerging uh, or the new political party, uh, we have two political parties. The first one is the Pum Jai Party. It's very interesting. Although, you know, the victory of the Pum Jai Party, you know, came from all political mechanisms. I will not uh, talk about it in details. But <laughs> it's very interesting because one of the things that the Pum Jai Party gained popularity among, in particular, uh, people in general, or you know, the grassroots people, is that it's policy. You know, in particular, the decriminalization of marijuana. Unbelievable! It gains a lot of popularity among you know, you know, uh, the, the like uh, the grassroots people, and in particular for the, the the hardcore people. You know, right? You know, because marijuana is something that you know has been banned in Thailand for many decades, but. Although so some you know organizations try to do the experiment, you know it's still you know not uh, legal. But anyway, when the Pum Jai Party came with a policy, you know to decriminalize you know, the marijuana, it gained a lot of popularity among you know the grassroots people or people in general. And anyway, 
we still have one more political party, which is the fifty forward party of Anakot Mai. Actually, you know, uh, uh, prior to the you know the Farak Paul uh, phenomena, we don't you know is uh, expect that that you know the future forward party will win not more than fifteen seats. I talked to someone you know in the the party. They accept that. They said we still we okay. We have kasa in Thai or popularity, but we don't have the thief, you know, something like that, you know. But anyway, things change. I think there are two things that contribute to the victory of the Anakot Mai party. The first one has something to do with the new waters. Because, you know, uh, given, you know, the hard measure that the NCBO, you know, launched to suppress the dissidents, it affected, you know, people in general, in particular, uh, the younger generation. You know, when it comes to the band of the song called Pratet Gumi, it affected a lot of, you know, and it brings the, a lot of dissatisfaction among the younger generation. That's the first thing. And uh, also, the second thing is that because of the uh, party list seat formula, which in fact is designed, you know, to on the one hand to block the landslide victory of the big or the major political party, and on the other hand, you know, to bring about you know like the middle-sized political party. But what happened is that rather than you know those you know in alliance with the military junta. The you know the winning you know by this uh, formula is the uh, future forward party. That's why they need to take the post-election coping strategy with the unintended you know consequences of what they plan. So what we have is you know for example we have the election commission rather than you know announcing the election result in two or three days, which is possible. It will prolong the announcement until, you know, not more than two days ago, right? As you know. And the second thing, we saw a lot of, you know, something fishy. For example, we saw the discrepancy between the numbers of voters and the number of ballots, which so far has not been made clear yet by the EC. And also, although we want the EC to disclose the, you know, the numbers of the ballots at the polling station, we still have not heard anything yet back yet from the EC. Actually, it's very easy. And this is, you know, we uh, resolve so many things because if you disclose the election results at the polling station, which many people have witnessed. So we can compare, you know, the numbers of the ballots, you know, you know I mean, combine them together and compare with the, the overall, you know, numbers of the ballots. That's, you know, one of the ways to uh, resolve the political crisis right now. But the EC doesn't do that, which, you know, we don't know the reason why. And, uh, in addition to that, the last thing is, you know, uh, the EC came with, you know, the uh, uh, party seat, you know, oh, oh, I'm sorry, the uh, party list seat uh, formula, which, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, the law academics or something like that, but uh, when we, you know, try to, uh, understand this formula. Many people, as, I mean, uh, those who like a pro-democracy, they, you know, said that this formula is, you know, in contradictory to, you know, the constitution and also the election laws, uh, the election laws. So I think this is a, 
one of the things that they cope with the unintended consequences. And we also have uh, the Constitution Court, you know. We saw a lot of Constitution Court rulings that are in favor of the NCPO or the Palang Bacharat Party. And we also have, you know, uh, uh, the political party in particular, uh, the Palang Bacharat Party. We saw what they did, you know, the resignation of the 15 cabinets, which now there's some ministry we don't have even one. You know, minister, unbelievable. Yeah. How could you, you know, govern the country? How could you administer the country, you know, without, you know, even one minister in a ministry? That's what happened in Thailand right now. And we also have the resignation of those in the NLA or the National As uh, Legislative Assembly. We also have the resignation of those in the NCBO too. And these people, you know, they are uh, prepared to be the uh, senators, you know, picked up by Prayut Chan Ocha. And, but anyway, I think although they have all these post-election coping strategy, strategies, it doesn't mean that it will be successful. It's not that easy. <laughs> Why? Today. Because, first of all, there are only three political parties that we vote, you know, for the, actually, you know, uh, that we vote for Prayut. You have a Palang Pacharat party. We have the Luang Pacharat, Luang Palang Pacharat Thai, and also a uh, Pai Bun uh, party, which, you know, when combined together, we have uh, about 121 or something, which is not 125, which is not enough, you know, when combined with uh, 250. Uh, and, for today, we have the uh, former election com members, Som uh, Chai, you know, he gave a press conference saying, uh, explaining how, you know, the uh, party list uh, seat formula, you know, is in contradictory to the constitution and also the uh, election law. And interestingly enough, we have uh, Anutin, Anutin, who is the leader of the Pumjana Party. He, you know, has posted on his Facebook saying that the Pumjana Party Party has not made a decision yet, which you know, uh, they will, uh, uh, which party they will support. They will listen to uh, the voice of the people, and. Also, we have one executive member from the Democrat Party saying that he is against the EC, yeah, uh, you know, a formula. Right. So, and we also have a Fujian Forward Party and also the Putai Party that will, you know, file a lawsuit, you know, right. via the Constitution Court, by the Ombudsman, and also by the, the court, you know, in, in general. And we also have like uh, so many people, you know, try to do the political gathering starting on this Sunday at Thammasat University. So things are not that easy. That's <laughs> why I think the coping strategy, you know, post-election strategies might not be that successful and it might lead to the uncertainty and chaos in the near future. Well, thank you very much. I think things are not that easy. Things are not that easy is probably a fair uh, summary of the situation, but uh, we'll leave it to Jonathan uh, to uh, review and perhaps uh, give us your own views. You might also, Jonathan, as uh, BBC, and you've got a feel for the international mm. media, uh, look at also how you think that Thailand's international image is you know being affected or being uh, seen in light of all this? And uh, yes, I think it's uh, worth um, casting our minds back to what led to the coup and the crisis in, uh, particularly when it erupted again in 2013 and 14. But that was, of course, an extension of previous crises that had gone right back to the coup against Thaksin in 2006. And at the time, uh, I remember very well reporting it 
people looked at Thailand aghast. They said, this place is a basket case. You know, it's not functional. The perspective today would be rather different. Um, the world is now full of basket cases. And if we even talk about, you know, the reordering of parties, look at the state of political parties in Britain and the United States. They're utterly discredited. You know, Thailand just doesn't look quite so bad by comparison anymore. <laughs> um, one thing worth remembering is that when the military took over in 2014, they argued that they were taking over to solve a crisis, although it was a crisis, in fact, in which they, they had their fingerprints all over it. It was something I confronted a member of the NCPO with, you know, who was going on about we had to step in. And I said, look, everyone knows you guys are on one side. Why don't you just come clean? You know, in, in 2008, you refused to back a government that had its international airport occupied. Uh, and it was a massive crisis. And the army refused point blank. That's General Anupong, who's the current interior minister, to back the government. In 2013-14, the Yingluck government was told in no uncertain terms that any use of violence by the police against protesters could create the conditions for a coup. But in 2010, the military at great risk to its own reputation, used large amounts of force uh, with huge loss of life to clear Bangkok. You know, we all know what side they're on. Um, it's the job of a journalist sometimes just to you know, call bullshit on that. And you know, I think a little bit of honesty would be helpful here. The military in 2014 claimed it was going to be a coup to end all coups. And their claim was that Thailand's long protracted cri political crisis required a fundamental root and branch solution. And we, of course, we saw the National Reform Steering Committee. We saw an ambitious plan to reset Thai politics. And I have to say, you know, among the protesters who were out there, particularly in the early stages of the 2013-14 protests, the PDRC protests, people there wanted to see a better and fairer election system. Whether they were right or wrong, they believed that the election system was rotten, the political system was rotten. Um, some of them, of course, believed in no elections at all but they believed that the military would reset things and would fix the problems. And I think that's where we have to make an assessment now of this rather chaotic election that we've just seen. Um, it's been dirty, there has have been, there's been huge amounts of, uh, uh, of uh, intimidation and pressure put on people to go on to particularly the military side. People have, been, have swapped sides from one party to another. Uh, there's large amounts of money being spent. In effect, the military government was able to sit in, in office at a time where under a normal system there would have been a caretaker government and spend vast amounts of money on sort of effectively bumping up its image. I'm, it's not for me to judge these things. I'm a journalist. I just see we can observe these things and we can see them. And this has been a classically um, dirty, manipulative Thai election. That's not, you know, most elections are like that. It's all about power. But the system has not been cleaned up. Uh, the current constitution uh, is much criticized. The election system wasn't even properly understood. Uh, the election commission was replaced uh, very suddenly by the junter in August of last year. So the new election commissioners, um, to give them some credit, were pretty new in the job, quite apart from having you know, soldiers breathing down their necks and not knowing what they could get away with and not get away with. You know, Thailand has not reset. We're, in a way, we are right back uh, to yet another stage of the long crisis has not been solved. It's not easy to solve these crises. If you now look at the state of advanced countries, you can see crises can be really intractable. No one should judge Thai leaders on the difficulty of solving the polarization that the country got into, these quite completely irreconcilable competing narratives. Uh, and in many ways, Thailand was a pioneer. You know, Thailand had polarization and populism long before you know, Europe had it at least in the open. Uh, the division between those who back Taksin Shinawat and those who back, we might call it the status quo, is a very, very bitter division. You can literally listen to both sides and they, there is no, com no comparison between them. They, there's no connection. Uh, as far as the anti-Taksin side is concerned, he is such an, you know, um, an appalling man that there is no way he can ever, ever be allowed near back power or anyone associated with him. If you listen to his supporters, their view is, you know, their, their electoral victories have been repeatedly uh, undermined and reversed by high-handed action from uh, unelected power bodies like the Constitutional Court or by the military. Those narratives are still strong. 
and they have not been sorted out either. So what we have to see when the dust clears from what is clearly going to be an extremely messy process of forming a government is has actually any progress been made since we had people out on the streets in Bangkok causing chaos. I think Thais became exhausted by that. I don't think there's much of an appetite to go and do that again. Both sides, red and yellow, have been on the streets and seen it achieve, certainly not achieve what they hoped it would. Um, I, the, you know, eventually new generations will think differently. And the other thing to consider is, you know, Thailand has had anemic economic growth and it's got at the moment fading export performances. It has industries that are no longer competitive. It has uh, a, a chronically inefficient education system that is not producing adequate uh, certain middle ranking uh, employees, you know, middle managers, uh, uh, technicians. Um, it has a, a growing income gap. Um, and you know, the, the, the fact is that you need a government that can start to address these things. And you, know, you could argue that the crisis has left Thailand without really an effective government right up until 2014. But in fact, the military government, with all of the advantages of Article 44, has really not made that much progress. It hasn't addressed the fundamental structural problems in Thailand. Uh, it's a conservative movement, the military. The last observation I would make about the current political system in Thailand, where we're at, is uh, this was very, very well reflected by James Wise in his book launch yesterday. He's observed this, that, that this is one of the last countries on earth hmm. where the military has a self-appointed right to intervene at any point it likes. Any point the military judges the situation, no, nobody else does. There's not a, a, a sort of at a referendum or a court that says, oh yes, things are so bad, we must have the military. The soldiers alone decide when they think they have to step in. Now, you know, again, that's a, it's a feature of Thai life. Thai coups have become so normalized, um, Thais kind of accept them. But you know, soldiers have very unusual training. Think about General Prayot. His entire life, until he got into government house, was in the barracks from the age of 15. You know, they're trained to drill, they're trained to kill, and it's, a, it's an exceptional kind of role. And most societies try and put a barrier between their armed forces, which are for a very particular purpose, and their political system. Um, and Thailand is the last one where there is no embarrassment at all about having soldiers everywhere and having the army intervene. Now, it's for Thais to decide whether they think this is a good thing or a bad thing. But of course, the way soldiers intervene, ordinary people don't get to decide, they get told. I mean, soldiers believe they step in precisely because they don't think ordinary people can be trusted. This is clearly something Thailand has to think about. Uh, Future Forward has raised the issue very seriously about cutting the military budget, uh, ending conscription, and c starting to curb uh, the military's ability to intervene in politics. And that's probably very likely the reason that Future Forward is being so heavily targeted now with uh, a range of what anybody can see are pretty spurious uh, legal charges. You know, you, it, the, problem for the, the problem with the military is they've got guns. And they, have, they don't obey laws. I mean, when they, when they take over the government, as they themselves admitted, I remember they told us this, that launching a coup was an act of treason. It's why they rip up the Constitution simultaneously as they seize power, because under that Constitution, they've committed treason. And they do this time and time again. And you have to ask, is this healthy, where large parts of society who don't want change or don't like the way things are going think in the back of their minds, oh, well, we can always rely on the military to step in. Uh, and that possibly is a, an issue that Thais now need to think about once they actually end up with a government in office. I'll leave it there. So thank you, Jonathan, again for um, bringing it round from uh, uh, turning from your very good point about the military's entrenched role in politics uh, back to this election, which was, no matter what you say and what we think, was an attempt of one sort or another, no matter how flawed, and people to... Voted, you know, and people voted, that. and we saw an extraordinary turnout. And I think uh, it's interesting, I don't think any of you have really highlighted this enormous effect of the youth vote and the fact that we had, what was it, seven million uh, first-time voters, quite a lot of enthusiasm, which partly drove the phenomenal performance of uh, Future Forward. Uh, so one can only, con you know, maybe it's not unreasonable to conclude that there, you know, a lot of the young voters who flock to Future Forward do sympathise with that 
uh, either anti-military or at least uh, that view of future forward that the military should be firmly put back in the barracks. But I'd also like to, we'll open it up to questions very soon, but as uh, the moderator's prerogative, I might take one, which is we had an interesting conversation before this panel. Um, Dr. Jade, you had some views I thought were, were interesting about, well, in the end, all this scrambling around about the makeup of the lower house and the fact that there's a lot of little parties who have, for one reason or another, ended up with one seat each, and you're going to have an extremely fragmented, messy situation of frantic uh, coalition building, deals being done, uh, very, uh, which makes up for uh, an unstable situation. But in the end, does this matter in the lower house? Because as we've been told, there's a Senate that is going to be appointed uh, as we speak, probably. It's being finalised. Uh, how powerful is the Senate? Does it matter? what the makeup of the lower house is and what is the extent of the power of one over the other. And maybe you'd like to um, take that on. Thank you for the question, Gwen. Of course it matters. Anyhow that the Senate has a vote on the Prime Minister, the parliamentary system here in this country still remains a parliamentary system. And it is still majorly the conventional parliamentary system. That means the lower house is to be the most powerful and to be the highly most significant house to, to work its way out of all these uh, political situations. So the close, very close proximity between the government and the opposition matters very much. And in a sense that if you look at the parliamentary system, normally those ministers, the cabinet members, will not vote in parliament. It's pretty much sort of a, uh, a courtesy or a sort of a political ideology somehow that there is a, a mannerism in the way in which a parliamentary system is to be structured. So let's say if you have 20 MPs who in the future will become the ministers, if these 20 MPs cannot vote, now each side, let's say from, from the numbers that the, the EC is announced, I, I think the Thai side is going to be about 243 something around there. Mm -hmm. The Palang Pacharan is about 257. So you can have this picture when 20 MPs become ministers, and if you cannot vote for whatever reason, or the opposition say, if you vote, then you're destroying parliamentary system, you so on and so forth, if you vote, blah, 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 whatever, that you can raise, okay? Then if the 20 MPs that became the cabinet member cannot vote, you're dead. Okay, so this can only be a, uh, a situation in which the minister take it serious. Because if the minister does not take it serious or the ministers do not take it serious, then who cares? They want to vote. Then no matter how close the proximity is, it doesn't matter. If you're down by one on the opposition, you're down by one. Okay. The, the positive side, people told me, of this situation is that normally MPs do not come to work, that situation will change. All the MPs will come to work. <laughs> they might not even go in to the toilet. Okay. <laughs> because if 10 goes to the toilet and the vote is called, then you're down by 10 and you will be losing. Okay. So that's the positive side of it. Now we're feeling sorry for the MPs. <laughs> But why does this happen? Why this situation occurs? Yes, of course, it's because the political arena that people are in differences to vote for small parties, for mid-sized parties, and for the big parties. But it, of course, is a result of the electoral system. Mm. This I do not deny. The electoral system that we call as a proportional system 
around the world cause this situation, any proportional system around the world will cause this situation that you will have big parties, you will have mid-sized parties, and you will have small parties. In Germany, you can see how long they take in order to establish the government. In Belgium, that's a year and a half in order to get a government. That's proportional system, okay? But the positive and good side of proportional system is that any sort of party will be able to compete in the political arena. It's up to the voters whether or not they will take all parties possible, or they will take only the big parties. But it turned out in this country, with the proportional system, they take all sort of parties. Okay. And with the calculation of a proportional system, to be real proportional, you have to go down all the way to the last digit of votes. Okay, so that's what it is. And therefore, what you see, people who cut off the votes, they're not talking about the real proportional system. And of course, many people ask me, why there is no threshold? That means a percentage of the number of votes to gain an MP. There is. There are two kinds of threshold. One is by number of MPs, which is used in this country. The number of MP will be no more than 500. That's, that's one sort of threshold. The other threshold is, of course, the percentage okay, that I already said. Therefore, we are now here to have this many parties, this two-sided, which are so close to each other, and the future that everybody on this panel has said mm -hmm. that will occur. Okay. Thank you. And, uh, uh, sorry, can I just ask, what, why did you choose? You say there's, there are two thresholds, but there aren't really, because the number of seats is, is decided in, in the entire electoral system. Mm -hmm. e every, you know, every parliament has a threshold of number of seats. The real threshold is, do you impose a minimum number of votes or don't you? And, and most, almost all proportional systems mm -hmm. do have a minimum threshold. And the reason they do is because while it's, of course, a proportional system is meant to have be as broadly representative of the voters' wishes as possible, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Parliament also needs to function and legislate. Yes. It needs to, to govern, not just mm -hmm. constantly follow the popular whim. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And for that, you need a, a manageable number of parties. Thailand yes, has yes. made a choice mm -hmm. to go so utterly proportional that you've got mm -hmm. par a party in there with 34,000 votes nationwide. Mm -hmm. and that's a party mm -hmm. that is barely known. Why did mm -hmm. you choose that system? Mm -hmm. Well, if you look overall, Okay, as you probably already said, that a proportional system is, is also to, to uphold polarization of the society because everyone is able to come in, whatever size of party. And the threshold that you were talking about, in most proportional system country, especially mixed member proportional, the threshold is the percentage, okay? but there's no threshold on number. So in Germany, the number can go whatever from, let's say you, you use 500 for the, the calculation. When you say you use 500 for the calculation, at first you use 500 as the divisive uh, number. Why it turned out that the number of member are 570? Is that wrong? Is that unconstitutional? Of course it's unconstitutional if you look at the number 500 that turned out to be 570, but it's not, because that's the system, okay? Why we choose this system? Because, of course, firstly, the polarization. Secondly, and if you compare this to the bowen sachs draft, the bowen sachs draft used the uh, mixed member proportional system that is very close to the German system. There were two votes. The problem of the two vote is that in the constituency, whoever votes for number two on all the way to the last all the votes will be falling out. Right. You don't use it at all. So that is why we land with the one vote, okay? Because that vote in the constituency will always be used to the last vote. And anyone who voted for the number two, three, four, five, you don't miss out. Because these 
numbers will be calculated through the party list. Okay. Lastly, if you put the whole system together, you will see that it is people-centric. It gears toward whatever people would want. And it gears toward each vote as the most important. Okay. And why we're using largest remainder? Okay. People were saying that, well, if you don't get one point something, then you don't get anything. The system does not do away with any integral number at all. You, every party keeps the integral number, but it only the fragment decimal that will be counted in the last round. Okay, so that is how we strike the importance of every vote. Otherwise, we will not be able to strike the importance of every so vote. The suspicion yeah. okay. that the military actually designed a system to create as many parties as possible, to have as weak a government as possible, so that the military supervision would be much stronger. That suspicion is entirely unfounded. Well, I was sitting in the Constitution and Drafting Committee, the longest of all, from the first day of the Bawan Saks draft to the last day of the Mishai's draft on organic law. Okay. I happen to be the committee member of the Bowan Saks, and I happen to be also the member of the drafter of the election law, which is the last law that came out. So I sat for so long in this situation. I can tell you that it was not designed by the soldier, by the military. Had it been designed by the military, why 8.4 million turned out to have fewer member of the parliament than 7.9 million votes? And the situation of the system, as many of us here said, give rise to future forward. Keep the strength of Pum Jai Thai. Driven Democrat away. And many other possibilities here, which was designed through the system long before any numbers happen. Okay. The formulas that many experts, as I already said, raised are all made after the election result. There is only one calculation that was made prior to the election. Prior to the law, there's only one calculation. Okay. And, and that's the calculation that I can explain. Okay, let's, yeah. uh, we can come back into this a bit further on, but there are people wanting to ask questions. So unless anyone has a burning uh, point to make, Paul, you were looking very... Uh, uh, no, I, I just wanted to say that um, I know I have some problems with the electoral formula, but besides that point, when we talk about we, you know, we made this formula, it's not we, it's a junta that overthrew democracy that then selected people like Micha and Bowansak to make this. If there had been a, a democratically uh, or indirectly uh, appointed constitutional convention, like back in 1997, then I would have more, I would say it has more legitimacy. But if this is from a junta, uh, it really lacks legitimacy. I mean, so, I mean, we can argue in theory about this, about this you know, type of formula, but it doesn't matter. It because was also a constitution put to a referendum. <laughs> yeah, right. But it was under a junta. Right. How democratic okay. is that? Point taken. Uh, let's just move on to questions here. Uh, can you please identify yourself and uh, sure. address you? Okay. Uh, I'm Matt Wheeler from International Crisis Group. Thank Hi, you, Gwen. Thank you to the panelists. Uh, there's been a lot of analysis post-election about the collapse of the Could Democrat you just speak party. up a little bit, Matt? We can't, I don't know. I'm bit. sorry. <clears throat> yeah, that's there's been, a, oh. <laughs> there's mm. been uh, a lot of analysis post-election about the collapse of the Democrat Party, the surprisingly good performance of um, the Future Forward Party. What I would like to hear from each of the panelists, if possible, is briefly an explanation for why Palang Pracharat seem to outperform expectations. Thank you. 
Thanks, Matt. Okay, uh, could you keep it very tight, but let's just run through. We could start this end, Jonathan, and work down. Yeah, sure. Um, well, in, 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 uh, in Bangkok, uh, Palam Prachirat basically became the de facto anti-Taksim party, which is partly why the Democrats collapsed, and that was very clear. Um, people took people who didn't want Taksim, and that's a lot of Bangkok middle class, simply looked at the two parties and said, who is going to be better at keeping Taksim out, the military or Abbasit Wejijiwa, who'd already said he wouldn't go into government with the military, and that possibly cost him quite a lot of support. Palam Prachirat's interesting because... Um, observations of their popularity, their profile, and, and what people thought of them in the months leading up to the election suggested they would do quite badly. They didn't have a high profile. They didn't have very many good candidates. In the end, they did manage to poach some good candidates, but they also threw a lot of money into campaigning. They were campaigning very hard and very lavishly in the last 10 days before the election. They really got their, their, me they got their message out there now. You know, there are, could be arguments about the huge advantages of incumbency, but it certainly was effective. I watched them in, the, in Isan, and uh, people there, it was in Roy Et, were die-hard Purtai supporters. But they were impressed. They were impressed by the candidates. They were impressed by the policy. The policies are very generous. There are a lot of very, very high-spending populist policies. I mean, they out-tax him, tax him. Um, now, whether they can afford... Whether they can afford to meet these uh, commitments or not is an open question. They've made some very big promises, but they did seem to have a big effect. Right. Thank you. And uh, Amazon, uh, your view of why the military-backed party did so well? Yeah, I think actually Palangwa Charlotte won the seats less than they have you know, announced before. Actually, they announced that they will win about 100-something, you know, but now... No one believes that. that. But no one believes that. But anyway, when it comes to the result, I think uh, there are uh, some factors contributing to this. The first thing is that uh, you know uh, some of the you know uh, politicians are the former politicians you know that were you know uh, sucked right sucked into yeah. you know the uh, Palangkochala party. That's the first one because you have the old political politicians. And the second thing is that they use the state apparatus. State apparatus means village headman. You have the sub district headman. You also have the district chief. You also have so many people in the state apparatus who work for the Palang Pacharan Party. Right. Right. This is not to mention those in the military barrack, you know, because when the soldier in particular, the recruit, you know, when you go, you went to the uh, polling station, you are, you know, uh, like, uh, you know, control by. Well, we we the, knew that would be the case. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, right. We knew but, that. Yeah, we that. actually saw it. There was a video. Yeah, right? I yeah. think the surprise. The right, question right, was right. really about the yeah. surprise factor. You were controlled by you know the spur intent yeah. or something like that. And the third, the third one is that they use like the so-called populist policy, which is much more than the populist policy than the toxins, you know. Uh, uh, right. uh, so regime. Toxin, you have toxin. like uh, you know so many you know. Uh, uh, Schemes that you know uh, put the money, you know, directly to the purse of the poor. That's why you know these people, you know, they enjoy this, you know. And a lot of people they say that some the reason why they you know voted for the Palangkaran Party because they are afraid that if you know uh, the Palangkaran Party, you know, is not you know the government. They are afraid that the schemes or the populist policy that they used to get will be discontinued. That's why okay. they voted for this. Yeah. Thank you. Paul, you Okay. Here. Well, I just make two points, basically. That, you know, first of all, a lot of people who had been Democrats in the past, really, they liked a strong man like Prayut. Yeah. And they really wanted him. And they thought that opposite was weak and vacillating. Uh, and so, yeah, sure. But I think also, <laughs> and second point, it certainly doesn't help to be the proxy party of the junta. And so you get lots of little advantages there. I mean, look, ISOC was going around in villages in Nissan. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it certainly doesn't help at all. So just make those two points. It doesn't help or it does help. I mean, it does help. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I sorry. think you yeah. meant it does help. It certainly Not helps. it doesn't help. It certainly helps Palang Prachat. Right. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and Jay. Well, there are actually uh, many factors to be said, but I'll make it short that they make use 
of the advantage that they have the political power in hand, just that. Okay. The only thing that make Palang Pacharat here what they are now is the political power that they have. Whether it's righteous, whether it's corrupted, they just use that, just as everybody said. That's how they, that's how they gain 8.5, I'm sorry, 8.4 million. So whether you like it or not, that is, that is what it is. Thank you. Michael. Uh, thank you, Michael Mackey, freelance. Um, just a, a quick question. Um, is it not possible that the parliamentary system, even flawed though it is, could actually contain all these conflicts? And the example I was going to give is that a lot of political scientists these days talk about Hollandization, which is where big parties break down into smaller ones. And what you end up with is constant fine tuning of coalitions, which would mean that the political process was seen to be going on while the real party, while the real power lay outside elsewhere, which would be compatible, compatible with what Jonathan was saying at one point. And Jonathan, I hate to disagree with you, but I will, because I'm me. And this model is not unusual. That you, there are certain states which are held together by the military. One is Egypt, another is Pakistan. And the, the political process, it goes through crisis. You know, we have high court judges in Pakistan kicking out premiers who go to London. Now, there's a coincidence. Is that really the future for Thailand? <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> Jonathan, that seemed to be a direct <laughs> challenge to you. Uh, no, I don't disagree with you. I mean, I, I should have said not unique. Yeah, but um, <laughs> the, the, the days of uh, sort of military governments being a, 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 a something quite normal in the sort of 70s and 80s should be over. In this region, we've seen the military retreat um, in the Philippines and in Indonesia, not completely, but certainly go back a long way. Even Myanmar, arguably, it's gone back from where it was, although not that far. It is odd that in Thailand, which is one of the most advanced countries in this region, the military maintains this extraordinary position. Yeah. But uh, right. on the other points, anyone wants to pick up? Uh, anyone else burning to mm. take that one on? No? Well, okay. Yeah, uh, let me say a little bit. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sorry, Jake. I think here in, in Thailand, uh, the situation between the military and the civilian government is also historical. Okay. When we first had our constitution and democracy in 1932, the group that set a coup to me, I call it also a coup. Okay, they staged a coup against His Majesty King Rama the Seventh. Okay, a revolution against King Rama the Seventh took the king down. Consisting of the military and the civilian, they struggle for power. They both want the power. They still both want the power. The military wants political power. The civilian wants the political power. In this country. Historically, ever since 1932 until now, I've never seen any one government truly doing anything for the betterment of this country, for the betterment of its people. But what they mostly do, the military, the civilian, all or almost all political parties, they're doing the utmost for their main benefit first. The people comes I'm not sure whether second or next to last, and the country comes last. So I think that's the problem. Why the situation occur? At least to me, and you can disagree with that. Uh, thank you. That's a suitably bleak view. Um, James, uh, uh, James, please Wise. identify yourself. Yeah, yeah, James not everybody Wise. in this yeah. room was at your <laughs> excellent talk last night. Thanks, so. Glenn. Um, uh, Jonathan mentioned that the military had claimed that the 2014 coup was the coup to end all coups. I was interested in the panel's views, and perhaps Professor Jade's in particular, whether the drafters of the 2017 constitution think that this will be Thailand's last constitution. 
because <laughs> um, from the comments from the panel members themselves, it seems they've actually designed a political system that's going to fail. Because panel members have used words like uncertainty, chaos, vicious cycle, unsolved problems, pandemonium, and I think captured by <laughs> something that Jonathan said about Thailand has not yet reset. So I'm wondering if you can tell us, first of all, how the drafters felt about this constitution, but also how hard is it to reform this constitution? And uh, given, uh, given the problems that seem likely to emerge, whether you expect that there will be a groundswell of uh, opinion or feeling in the political class and more broadly in the community for a new constitution? <coughs> well, to your, to your first question, I'm not sure about the, the other drafting members, but to me, myself, even at this point, I've never thought that there will be an ending of the coup to this country. As long as the mentality and the temperament of the military does not change, a coup is always possible in this country, and I don't know for how long. 30 years, 50 years, 100 years, I don't know. But as long as those two things and main, many more about the military do not change, a coup is always possible. So drafting the constitution, I did not think that such constitution will be able to stop the coup, no way. Secondly, when we look at all these design, of course it's very, very hard for reform. The Constitution aims for one thing, to reform the country, which when there was dissolution of the National Reform Council, which when I was in the Bawan Sachs Committee, we worked closely with that council. When there was dissolution to such council, I know the reform will not be possible any longer. And if the reform was not possible, reconciliation of people the polarization of this country will also not possible. And that's what happened until now. The last thing, a new constitution, well actually I myself, at this point or a little bit down the road, would like to see that maybe we just void or nullify the result of the election. Start all over again with an election of drafters, you can do, you can use whatever system, okay? When the drafter comes, whatever happened, televise the drafting of the Constitution. Everybody should be able to see. If you want to criticize, go ahead, criticize. You want to comment, whatever you want to do. And in the end, this Constitution goes to referendum. And we have the next election from then. So this should be, I think, the highly and the most open mechanism to draft the constitution. So to answer you, I think we will have the new constitution. Okay. Right. But by which mechanism, by which means, I don't know. Right. Thank you. Any uh, other views on that? Uh? Yeah. Uh, I would say that this constitution will likely last longer than the last long constitution. <laughs> <laughs> How much uh, is that saying? But that's, that's like so maybe like seven years or ten years. Uh, wow! But um, that was 2007 to 2000, uh, whatever. Yeah, se yeah, seven actually years. 13. Yeah, yeah, seven years. So why? Why am I saying that? Because I think this constitution is reflective of what the military and the traditional institution that stands above the military want to preserve. Uh, they, you know, what the powers that be don't want is some strong political party coming up and challenging their prerogatives. Uh, and, and these prerogatives have been dominant throughout uh, most of Thai history. So, you know, if there is another constitution, it would likely come as a result of a military coup, likely. And why would there be a military coup? Well, because maybe there'd be another Thai Rock Thai party that upsets the apple cart of this powerful uh, m and I like to say. <laughs> I won't talk about that much, but uh, if you know what I mean. <laughs> right. Thank you. Okay. Uh,
Final question. I think uh, final question there. Yeah, my name is Daniel Peller, and I'm a lecturer at Tamasat. And I would like to follow up on this last last question, and I hope I'm not going to get too hot, but. Um, the uh, Jonathan Head was pointing out that the military, by its very nature, is a, is a tradition-bound conservative institution, and certainly uh, in Thailand it seems to be. Now, that kind of an institution needs one key ingredient to be able to stage its coups, and that is the support of the traditional found of authority. Now, I don't quite understand why everybody assumes that that traditional found of authority would automatically sign off on such a thing, because it seems to me that... Um, we are dealing with somebody who's not very fond at all of others staging power grabs in his name. All it would take is for a certain somebody to say, not in my name, in the manner of a Juan Carlos. Now I know we're not dealing with a Juan Carlos, but those three words would end any future coups. Is that not a possibility? Not for democratic reasons, but for reasons of his own? Who'd like to take that one? Oh, Jonathan, I think that was direct. <laughs> I think one, the, the rea again, it comes back to saying how things are. And again, I refer back to James Wise's excellent book where he makes the point that Thailand is unusual because where you normally have three arms of government, which are classically your executive, your judiciary, and your legislature that balance each other out, Thailand has five arms, which include the monarchy and the military as separate sources of power. And it makes it different uh, in, from many other countries. And I think if you look at the history of modern Thailand, you know, the monarchy has been absolutely center stage. The revival of the monarchy, because it's worth remembering what a low ebb the monarchy was at when King Bumipon took the throne in 1946, but that that could not have happened without a partnership with the military. These are two institutions which have this symbiotic relationship, and that, will, that relationship will possibly be far more influential on what happens in Thailand than anything that happens to a parliament. Parliaments and constitutions are sort of disposable in Thailand, but the monarchy and the military are permanent, and it's their, their relationship which will have a huge influence on what happens next. You've raised a valid point, which is obviously, you know, people got used to the rather subtle relationship between the military and the monarchy under the old king. Nobody quite knows what the partnership is gonna be like under the current king, and I doubt anybody here would have the courage to speculate. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's not. I, I we think we'll, um, we'll, okay, Paul, uh, let's this, just uh, keep it Now that it you jumped into this uh, discussion. Yeah. You can <laughs> oh, keep maybe it rather short, would. please. I will, yeah. I will guardedly add to you what you have said. And there has been no successful military coup in this country without the king's endorsement since 1977. And as a result of that fact, we understand that the traditional institution has a great deal of power over the military. Why? The military gets its legitimacy from the monarchy. In fact, uh, you could refer to the military as a sort of monarchized military. It's extremely dominated by, obviously, by the traditional institution. So as a result, yes, these are very two in integral uh, institutions that uh, have a sort of partnership. Thank you. And okay, I would like to add okay. something. Again, Probably very short, please. Perhaps, perhaps maybe sensitive, but I think we have come to a new chapter uh, about the relationship between the monarchy and the military. Rather than, you know, uh, something, you know, from this tense, now it becomes like uh, something that you know, the same. So you, you cannot see, you know, how things are going on in the military. And we see how the king tried to consolidate its power through the military himself. So it's different from you know, what we saw in uh, the reign of King Rabat IX. So I think we're gonna see some things you know, different. So it might not be that kind of coup, but it might be something else. Right. Yeah. Okay, thanks. That seemed intriguing. <laughs> Let's leave it there. Uh, Jade, do you have anything to add? Well, I just have something short. I opt for a constitutional monarchy. Just that. Right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, and final question uh, to Marwan, please. Hi, yeah, uh, Marwan Mark, Mark of the Cajun Review. This is to Ajahn Jade, and of course, it deals with the monarchy. So on Friday, the regime is going to submit the names of 
250 senators for the palace to endorse. What is the time frame for the palace to respond? <laughs> and can the palace reject nominated na names and nominate alternatives? Uh, there's no particular time frame. Mm. However, because the the House of Representatives will will have to be inaugurated 15 days after the the uh, the announcement, okay, the formal announcement of of the result of the the election. After that, there will be an appointment to the Speaker of the House. Yeah. Then, the Constitution also did not say when the next session, especially the round of session on election of the Prime Minister should be had. So I really don't know. Your mm -hmm. second question, whether or not the senators, the name of the, uh, the proposed senators can be changed. The Constitution already specified the, the, uh, the process, okay? So unless going through that process, I don't think the names will be changed. So just that. Right. Thank you. Well, I think on, on that happy note, unless there's anybody with a, a burning uh, point to make, or if uh, any of the, sorry? Uh, okay, if it's short, we were really <laughs> trying to, okay. <laughs> one more. Okay, is that all right with you guys, if we have one more? It's, we're it's trying to be democratic going back here. to Jonathan's issue about the business and the actual living conditions of the society. Because when I listen to you... Can you identify yourself, please? Oh, sorry, Jesper Dripping, Mahedon University. I, when I listen to you, it's like there isn't actually, at present stage, any political power or will to do something about the economical situation that Thailand is actually in. I would like short comments. Is that really true? I guess we'll find out once we've got a government. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Would anyone else like to comment on that? No? All right, look, I think uh, that's been a really, it's been an excellent uh, take on uh, the results we've heard in the last 24 to 36 hours. Uh, I'd like to thank the panelists. And, um, <laughs> Much. And please bear in mind next week, uh, Future Forward uh, leader here to tell you himself what he, how he sees it, plus uh, various other programs coming up on our website. Thanks very much. <laughs>